one's name is getting out there more and more. There have been workshops on the East Coast in Maryland and Virginia for seven or eight years, and the last three years, the Paul Rowland Workshop has come to Illinois. We're very excited about that, and so we're going to be talking to you just at the very end with a little blurb about it. But um, I, I want to just get started right, right off the bat with talking about the pedagogy and how important it is that we think about the whole body and the movement of the body in relation to the right hand and the left hand. So often as teachers we talk about here's what the right hand should do and we take a student's right hand and we say now look at that thumb you know and not paying any attention to all the tension that's going on in the rest of the body creeping up and having an impact on that thumb that you're talking so you know so intently about with a student. So, so that's what we're going to talk about today. Be prepared to get up and to move and to feel some of the actions. And um, so with that being said, let's go ahead and get started. Um, there's a plaque at the University of Illinois that says this. I think it's so amazing that there is a plaque at a university for a string educator. How many places have a plaque for a string educator? This is like an awesome thing. Uh, when I went last summer and saw the plaque for the first time, I was very touched by it. Um, and I did ask, um, and the university a, co a couple years ago had a, a promotion of, of looking back to highlight outstanding educators at the university. And throughout the campus there are, in different areas, there are plaques. But by the music building, there is a string educator. So I'm, I'm very proud of this. I'm very proud of the, the work that I had done at University of Illinois with Paul Wilson. So this is the science-based movement principle. Um, he did a whole federal grant when he created this project that is many shelves long in his writing. And then culminating in not only teaching college level students, but having young children come in and he taught the children as the college students observed. And the final product was a trip to Washington DC to perform at the White House. So this was a big deal. The Office of Education was looking for interesting new ideas, and this was kind of a new idea, although he had found back in Hungary before he ever came to the States that there were a lot of people writing about this concept instead of left side, right side, or uh, upper, lower, that sort of thing. They were actually beginning to write about the whole, um, the whole process of how the body moves with playing. And so um, what we're going to show to you today is not a systematic first step this, then this, then this, this is how you would teach a young child. What we're going to do is show you the top 12 favorite actions. About 15 of the Roland pedagogues or instructors were polled by Nancy Cradle. I don't know if any of you know her. She's in Virginia. And um, she came up with a list of what the favorite actions are that are being used by those people, um, myself included, Joanne included. And so um, what we'll do now is just show you what those are. Um, so of the 15 or so people polled, number one is the shuttle. And that's what number 11 means. 11. There were 11 hits on that one. So that's how 11 out of 15 okay. people like it. Um, so I really. I like the shuttle quite a bit, and I use it with my beginners when I'm setting up, especially in cello. Um, when you get the positions established, you use uh, your left arm swinging around in the uh, low position, middle position, high position. And in doing this, this is also done a lot in Suzuki, Tanya Carey showed me this, um, it makes sure the cello is set. Because if you're trying to do that and they think they want, they want to hold the cello with their left hand, you're not holding your cello with your left hand. This really amplifies that, that issue. So it secures the hold and gets this left arm to a great elevation without saying, lift up your elbow. So I, I really love the shuttle. And we'll throw it in, and, you know, sometimes the student's doing something getting really tight, I'll say, just do a strum for me, do a shuttle loose, just, just to free them up. That's a big thing about rolling is to free things up, don't get tight. Yeah, and so in, in upper string playing, the shuttle, Roland, um, I studied with him for three years, and so I had all of these lessons, and he would often say pretty much nothing in a whole hour. He was very, very few words. And um, one of the things he would do is put that picture there because it reminded me of, here's my music, and here is the little symbol. He would take his pencil and go like that. 
well, what that told me is I'm not shifting right. <laughs> you need to make sure that instead of going here to here in a straight line, that you actually start somewhere, release and land somewhere, and if it's a double shift, land again. So usually it was the double shift, so that's my memory is the, the birdie. He, he, did, he called it, it's, it's the way, he did a wonderful Hungarian accent, but I can't imitate it. <laughs> It's the way a, bird, a child would draw a bird. That's how he would say it. And so, so the birdie shifts are this arc motion, and always he was thinking from the, el the point of the elbow. In fact, often in those pedagogy classes with the children, he, he was very um, forward thinking. He didn't take their, their hand or their arm or touch them. If they had a sleeve, he would just take the sleeve. Now, isn't that a great idea for our string teachers who are not allowed to touch children? I think if you take the sleeve with their permission, is it okay if I take your sleeve now? Go like this, and this, and this, and look what happens to the hand. I mean, it just goes there. It's, it's a beautiful feeling of the large muscles getting engaged first, and then later adding the finger action that's gonna be a little heavier, lighter, heavier, lighter. You can go into more detail. Um, part of our presentation today is going to be about public and private instruction. Uh, we've both done both, and um, I love working with large groups. That's, that's probably my favorite thing to do. But when I have a student one-on-one, -on -one, that's what I would do. If I have a large group of students, I'm going to go, um, this is the image that I would like for you to have. That's the motion. Everybody try it. And it's also not coming straight at me. It's coming toward my center. Okay, so can you all try that? I forgot about the book. Let's try this motion and then I'll show you the book. I want you to see what I'm doing. Okay, so take your left hand. I'm going to do it this way. Oh my gosh, I've learned how to hold a bow with my left hand because of mirroring uh, image. So here we are, and now we're going to extend just a little bit. Pretend like we're rolling with it. too large and straight. And now we're going to take the point of our elbow. And if you don't have a sleeve, you can just touch. Arc, it's coming in and actually going a little more this way and then we'll touch it on the even further. Now, muscle bound guys, I taught a beginner class with high schoolers and I have some pretty muscular upper body uh, guys and sometimes they, they can't they can't do this yet, but they can come a little bit that way. So they understand the motion and then we gradually get it to be more and more flexible as it goes on. Okay, the book. Um, my student is here, my three students are here, and um, Allison brought the book. This is the Teaching of Action and Screen Playing that Paul Rowland wrote as a part of that research project. It doesn't look like this anymore. This is an old version. The oldest version we also still own, which is a white cover, and you have it too. Uh, but Allison has the, the, the look of the cover now is this. Um, it, is, it is available on Amazon, and you, know, you can Google it, but um, the Teaching of Action and Screen Playing it's if you want available in the hall somewhere. Yes. Somewhere? Yeah. 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 They, they did get them here. here. Okay, yeah. so they are available. Um, if you want to pass it around, do you mind? Yeah. Uh, people can take a look. That would be great. Um, so that's what the shuttle is all about, just being able to do this arc motion, the elbow leads, and the bird, bird wing. Um, okay, next. Flying pizzicato. Well, you, yeah, you're going to start that one. But um, while she's getting ready for that, it, I, with another team of writers, worked on a method book, New Directions for Strings. And my publisher, when they saw I was presenting, said, Is, can we have any materials here? And I said, well, Roland did influence a lot of the pedagogy behind the writing of the book, sure. So the bags of, um, in the back are from FJH uh, for you. And if you would look, if you had got a bag. On page seven is a picture of what Joanne's gonna start off with right now. So flying pizzicato is going to teach students, I'm going to come around so you can see me a little bit, um, is teaching students these three things. Whole body movement, encouraging long bow strokes and straight bow strokes, and also bilateral motion is what Roland coined the movement of the body in relation to the bow arm. So as soon as everybody gets yeah. what they need, come on back and then we'll try some of those. Meg and Abby Alba did a session and they were talking about the sun rising in the center of the palm of the hand so that students can see the center of the palm of the hand, not down here. It doesn't, it doesn't 
encourage the elbow to be in the right place. So bringing this here, I like to think of it more as an elbow thing where the, the sun comes up. And so the fingers are perched in sort of a rooftop over a spot. Nancy Cradle likes to use one of those big sticker dots that's red, yellow, blue, those, those colors. And uh, students can see, kind of see them and their hand would perch right over about the center of the fingerboard. So that's the left hand positioning, but all of that is not so important in this flying pizzicato. What flying pizzicato is, is moving the whole body, so I'm, I'm imitating a bow stroke across the strings and actually making an oval that almost, the way Roland would say it, draws a line down the center of the body. How many of us have students who bow this way? And so what we do is encourage right before they even, we'll do this without an instrument first, before they even have an instrument in their hand, they're gonna go out and start imitating a straight bow stroke. That's the hard part. And the, the bilateral motion then is center yourself I always had a, tr a problem with students understanding if they started in the center, so I would have them lean a little bit to the right. Exaggeration is really a good teaching tool. <laughs> and then, so the bow arm is going this way and the body and instrument is, is going this way, okay? And so that's what flying pizzicato is all about. We will strum across all the strings so we don't have to worry about worry, 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 am I gonna hit the D string? but later that comes. So again, that's another level, but start with the full, all the strings. Doesn't matter if they hit just one, you know, they're just not having to think about that part. So that's what flying pizzicato is. Do you wanna all stand up and try that? Just Im imitate the motion. It really needs to be standing. I had this discussion with one of my- Except for cellos and it works yeah, fine. Except for yeah. cellos and- Oh, we right. just rock right. from one side to the other and it works fine. And when I have a large group, I like to t um, have them <laughs> consider as they're finishing the, um, coming around with the arc that they're going towards the front, like come around to the center. It's the center, yes. but I have them come, think about coming back this way. So if you're, ch you want to practice the cello one, you just follow Joanne right. yeah. 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 um, Okay, so- I have so. a question about the feet placement. Roland, Roland was really very, was very, loud. we had a big argument over? about this. That, uh, I'll come over here. So, so he said, um, start with the feet this way and then just go a little bit to the side. He's even okay. got a, a little, uh, actually a, a diagram in the, in the big yeah. book there. But he shows it with this left foot a little bit forward in the diagram. <laughs> what, what I find interesting and significant is that the feet are not as far apart as what the Suzuki people would do a little bit more. The pie chart thing with Suzuki little kids is there's more shoulder width, and I find that just personally to be more comfortable. So somewhere in there is fine. And he wasn't real. He, we decided that as long as you're not rotating, and that is a problem with this flying pizzicato thing that some sometimes students will go <laughs> because they've got that bilateral thing, but it does, it's not the idea of loosening up these muscles down here. It's very tense. So let's try it. Ready? Go. So think about your, where your bow arm is going and move away from it. And you know, if you haven't done this before, you might be going the same direction as your bow arm. So you just turn around and go the other way. Okay. And then we would pick a, a particular string, maybe, and outline a bass line and put on some music and then go a little faster and make your circles a little smaller. And we would play. I made the mistake in my first year <coughs> teaching of knowing all this technique and teaching it just like that. But if you make music out of it right off the bat, it's just so fun for the students. Yeah, and page seven has examples of tunes to do um, with, with the open string flying pizzicatos. So um, the next slide is um, tapping. And I, um, I requested to start with this because what I find often with my beginners, especially if they're younger, is the strength in the, in the hands is so important for cello. Uh, an issue for intonation often is that they're actually not holding the string firmly enough to have the pitch be clear. And you, you'll find that when they pizzicato and you get the thunk sound. But um, <clears throat> what I like to do with the tapping is start just with little raindrops here. First doing loose, loose tapping um, 
idea to be free. But then to come to the string, and at first I do have them do it any, just wherever your hand stops, it doesn't matter, on cello. And then tap the fingers independently. They're all sitting on one string, so the hand is getting its nice shape. Tap a finger, a number one. By this time I've labeled the finger numbers. Oh, some of you can't see my cello. So I tap here, two, three, four, and backwards. But then I, I want them to get to the point where I want them to make what I call popcorn. So when they actually tap, you actually hear a little pinging sound. So there is that actual percussive technique in the strengthening of the hand that I find is really, really important and necessary for cello. So Roland does the tapping a lot. And for, for me, for cello, it's very much a matter of strengthening and coordination. And it's an exercise I use a lot with students at many stages, because I'll even find, um, if I get a remedial older student who comes who has their hand and um, they learn some distorted hand shapes, I'll go back to tapping because it's so natural. You just go, it's like, I loved all Phyllis Young's exercises she would do. You know, she would like, hey, grab the cup and you grab it. She said, that's a perfect hand shape. So <laughs> it's the same sort of thing with the left hand. It goes to its own natural, it'll go to a natural shape. So go back to natural things first with students and tapping is a helpful one. Tapping releases the large muscle tension, not so much the fine motor, it releases the bigger muscle. And so um, I used the term, same as what you said, ping, the clavichord fingers, and I would use that sort of as another additional yes. teaching tool. Okay, do you know the difference between a harpsichord and a clavichord? And the clavichord um, actually has a hammer with a little metal end on it. So imagine that your fingers have little metal inserts on the ends and you can hear like ouch yeah yeah sometimes I would get that reaction like oh don't do that to the poor children so I would say but you, you don't have to if you're really strong about your fingers you can hear it so that was my, the image that I liked and I also like to use that as trill exercises if they're using the bow already and they don't know how to slur yet oh my gosh this is what you do you know start with not two notes in a slur like most <laughs> students are like, oh, I can't do that, but do this, like, this is really fun. So now you get two things going at the same time. You're teaching them slurs, you're teaching them how to get a nice, quick release on the finger and a strength that's going down. Um, then the other side of tapping, although when Nancy did this eight, eight hits on tapping, um, she didn't include right hand, but I thought, shoot, Roland did that more than left hand with me. He was always telling me to relax my bow hand. And you don't just tell a student to relax, you know, it just it doesn't work. So, um, so we would do things like, you know, hold, make a loop with your fingers and put it inside of here and imitate the bowing. And now, um, now, as you're moving in a bow direction, tap your little finger. With, with younger children, I'd just hold still, make sure they're relaxed and tap, tap, tap. And now the index finger would be the next one. Pinky's always the first, just because that's the problem with a child. Okay, so then we go to tap the index finger and make sure it's relaxed and that the placement isn't over here. That was one of my problems. It isn't too far back here and you know, going straight, that it's relaxed and comfortable in a nice spot. And shaking and tapping also goes together. And then he would go into the middle finger. Um, I, we had names. I did Suzuki with my kids a lot. So and I did some of that teacher training, called this Mr. Curved Pinky. Um, n nobody had a name for this one, and so my students one time called it George. So it was <laughs> uh, Mr. Tall, tall, tall Finger and Mr. Ring Finger, and I don't know why they were all Misters, but it just worked out that way. And then Mr. Bent Thumb underneath. Now Roland actually would have me rip, set, I'm not going to even do it for you because I can't do it, but set my bow on the string and then release my thumb like tap your thumb, because that's the biggest muscle of the hand here, and that's where a lot of tension, you know, banana thumbs, so we want that to be relaxed too. And then he would start having me do some slow bow strokes doing each one of these tapping exercises. Well, that really releases everything that goes all the way. Not back here, though, so always check. Um, exaggeration, have your students go all the way up tight, and now oh, drop it down. Now, right away, let's do tapping. So, so it's both sides. The tapping exercises really are very, very effective. <laughs> well, she's getting ready for the next slide. I neglected to thank Robertson for the use of this instrument. I was looking at this beautiful bow as I was tapping. It's like really gorgeous. So stop by Robertson and take a look at this beautiful bow. And thanks to them for the cello, too. I did not travel with the cello. <laughs> okay, so now we're rock and roll. Um, you have a way that you remember Roland saying rock and roll. Mm -hmm. uh, Z rock and Z roll. 
<laughs> and for me, I remember rock and roll. There was like sort of a whisper in his voice. He's a very quiet man. Um, and so anyway, the rock and roll thing was his clever little way of saying, okay, we're going to do two things at once. Well, later on, we're going to talk about this you know, positioning the hand, getting the bow ready, balance point. But for right now, I'll just <clears throat> begin with hanging the bow. This is how you teach, teach the bow hold, have the students do this and do this. So they're already able to hold the bow. Now, the rocking part is just a shaking. Shake out the tension. See this? I'm holding the bow now. Got it. You know, how many of us are like, I've got the bow hold. Look. Everything is curved. My thumb is even touching the hairs. Is it okay? And you know what? Many times I would say yes. Oh my gosh. No, it's really not. So let's do this. We've got the, the positioning, now let's just shake this out. Okay, so that's the rocking part. It's like rocking a little cradle. And then the, the rolling part is, what, do, what does this look like, what we just did? Flying pizzicato, this is the same, we can't even go over here. Ugh. It's just, it, it goes this, this way, to be able to extend the arm, and we want the students to be able to extend so that they are learning where the patterning of that large muscle is going to give us a straight bow stroke when we're on the string. Okay. This, and this is on page 12 of the book if you want to see a picture. All right. So then so. when you, if you put your bow in the middle, you can do that now, right? Yeah. Put your bow in the middle, then you can um, roll it across the strings, and you can lift and place it in different parts too. So they get the idea in a silent, Wonderful silent exercise <laughs> <laughs> to get their bow moving right. appropriately. Right. I'm telling all my mistakes as a teacher. One of them was, it has to be silent. I would say to my students, oh no, that, that it has to be silent, would make them get tense again. You know? So I, I realized that and said, oh wait a minute, it's okay if you make a little creaky noise. And and sh and shake and different. This this lift in place is extending the bow stroke. He would do low, middle, high. He did low, middle, high here. He did low, middle, high here. So the low, middle, high language was very common, commonly used in his teaching. Um, so that's our rock and roll fun, relaxing those muscles. And now, Joanne, you're doing this one, right? Yeah. Um, so the rebound is. Um, to me, it's a, it's a kind of funny term. It's actually the flying pizzicato done with the bow. So you do a quick stroke, you grab the string, release, travel through the air, and land again. So again, uh, around this page 12 is where we're doing the, the retake is a word we use here. There's so many different words we use for lifting, circling, whatever. But the important aspect is that you keep the same idea that you have from the rock and the roll and the flying pizzicato. You apply it to actually making a stroke. Set and rebound. And the bilateral action. I'm standing up. I get to do this easy. <laughs> <laughs> but you can do it sitting down. And you talk about sits, sits bones. Well, I sometimes do sits bones, but students don't always know that. I just kind of, I just say rock side to side. They, they get it. The child's usually will move pretty easily. So I was also thinking about that. Especially on, if you started early. On the bridge thing that you you cellists all do. But yeah, you can put the bow on the bridge and roll across them. And it's really a visual for the students because they see that arc. And it really helps them understand. Oh, that's the same kind of thing happening in arc. Um, and so rebound, basically the same thing. We're doing bilateral motion now only with the bow. And we start with short strokes near the frog, balance point area. I got real picky also about putting a, a mark on my students' bows, you know, where the balance point is. And then I realized once the mark was off, we didn't know where the balance point was anymore. It's helpful to use these various uh, strategies, the, the early bow hold, but don't stay there very long. Get them, you know, encourage them. Otherwise, they develop a habit, and it's a wonderful feel, but it's not the real thing yet, you know, so let's get them down here to the real thing. Same way with, with uh, oh, I have all sorts of, I went to Australia, and I got these, these little clip-on koala bears that ha the head turn, can turn face them or can turn the face out. And, and they're just so cute, but 
um, you know, the koala bear thing is heavy for one thing, and the other thing is that it doesn't really help them when they have to find the balance point without the koala bear. And it was just my koala bear. I couldn't give it to all the students. So sometimes, you know, the, the helps are, are just temporary, and you make sure that you get to the real thing as quickly as you can. Um, let's, let's all do, do a little activity with bilateral motion doing um, this rebound, which is the flying pizzicato thing. We'll talk about what we think next. But would you all stand up and sing? If you don't have an instrument, um, would you mind singing Twinkle, Twinkle Little Star? Okay. And we're going to do a bass line for those of you who are playing. And so we're going to do, um, you know, D and then G and then D and then A. And this is what I would do with students. Ready? Go. Twinkle, Twinkle. exercises. Roland was creative beyond creative, <coughs> coming up with all of this pedagogy. But um, when Joanne studied with him in a pedagogy class, and then when I studied with him maybe in a lesson, and when we talked to Nancy and Lynn and the other people who studied with him, Jerry Fishbach, we find out that, oh really? He said that? You know, we were with him at different times <coughs> in his life, and he was constantly changing things and being creative. And the one, if there's one thing that I remember the most about what he said to me as a player is never be bored when you practice. If you're practicing bilateral motion, think of a different way than what I'm telling you. Get creative and, and write it down. Or if you're practicing a really difficult shift, it's first to seventh position. Stay with that, but think of tunes that would have that little, you know, two note pattern in it and sing the pattern in your mind. Or, or play it and uh, listen to somebody else play it and then make a duet out of it, like you're on the seventh and they're on the first. And he was always telling me, you know, don't be bored in your practice. I must have looked bored. <laughs> I'm just thinking about that right now. Oh, dear. Okay. Anyway, but I did learn a ton, and it was just so satisfying at the end of my uh, time with him that a couple of years later I saw him at an ASTA conference. And, Thing in Chicago, was it? Was it uh, yeah, it must have been an ASTA conference. And he just wanted to sit down and talk to me. He wanted to talk that time about my career as a teacher and what I was learning. And he was very interested in music education as well as the, the pedagogical applied um, side of it. Um, okay, so that is uh, finding ways of using pop tunes, anything. On that slide before it. Oh, I did read, I forgot what you said. Um, Flexible bows, ab frog, the fluffy frog. Oh, fluffy fro. Okay. Fluffy. Yeah. There's there are two terms that Jerry Fishbach coined. We love you know the creative. I think Roland would have just loved this, but he didn't come up with it uh, as far as I know. Flexible fingers at the frog. The other one is putrefet. You all know that one. Kids love to say that. It is just pull pull in with the ring finger approaching the frog. <laughs> <laughs> and I would write putrefet on uh, uh, the lesson plan for the day or what I was going to work on, you know, put it on the board. And, you know, this is that. And, and so, you know, just having some flexibility. And so Fluffy Fro, uh, there, I have designed a bunch of exercises. I should probably get them written up someday. Um, fluffy Fro, like, is just short rebounds this way. And then doing a couple of, of like three notes. And, and then, you know, at the front. You know, how about we do it at the tip? That's a little harder because the fingers are more extended here. So it's a little more of a fine, um, subtle change in the bow fingers. But that's why we do it at the frog first and then adding bilateral. And then the retake, of course, is that's the, the rebound. Fluffy fro. So I would do fluffy fro before the retake, and those are all little exercises that I can do it too. You know, be, being creative, I'm trying to think like, what would Paul Rowland do? He did a wristband or something. Okay. Um, all right. So now we have um, the next slide is Statue of Liberty, and the Statue of Liberty. Uh, I learned something when I was watching Abby and Lynn. Um, of actually doing it where your, your students are holding the bottom side of the instrument and turning it around and placing. And uh, he would say place this button at the center of the neck in the films, it says that. To me that's just, that doesn't feel right. 
I like it a little bit over here. Um, I did have somebody look at my setup and say, oh, I think it's too far over your shoulder. Try it here. I'm like, okay, no, I don't think so. No, no, it doesn't work. But really, again, had flexibility in his ability to see the body and the different shapes and sizes of, of people. So um, what I've done in, in my team, so the, the thumb would be here in the curve of the neck when you do that one with the two hands. But I did not like letting go. And there is a reason to release that right hand with students holding this way, this always made me very nervous. So I went a la Suzuki style and did it this way because it's very, much more secure this way. Plus, I would say point your thumb at you this way. The thumb is pointing back here. If the thumb isn't pointing at you, it can start a collapsing hand. And so this creates a straight line between these knuckles and the elbow, straight line. Okay, so now, I'm getting my feet in position, I'm making sure that I'm balanced, and I do the Statue of Liberty this way, a la Suzuki too, man, a lot of great ideas coming from various all over pedagogues, and then quickly turn it upside down, because this is harder, a lot harder than this, and now we check the line, I saw Suzuki in Chicago, by the way, I was on stage with him, with about 800 other teachers, it was pretty cool, and um, my nose is pointing to the back of the instrument, and now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to aid with this hand to place it. The very first time you place the instrument is what the child will remember. If you can't be the one to guide it in there by yourself with 30 kids and you're starting beginners, then you do it at, with certain language, like on top of your shoulder, because the common problem is this. The other thing is strength through relaxation. Did I say that? Yeah. Position of strength, easier, oh, feels so good. It's as opposed to, everybody get your instruments out of your case, get the shoulder rest on. Now, we're going to put it over here, and it's going to go like this. And this is what we get if you're not able to have your hands on each student. One-on-one, -on -one, you can do that with a group. Yeah, and with the cello, um, it's just straight out and bring it in. I, I usually start with standing, feet are set, sit on the edge of your chair, cello out, bring it in, then I like to give the hug. The hug helps them feel that it's in the pocket of the body and figure out where the heck these pegs go in relationship to their head. It's a, it's a big challenge with the body um, placement of the cello. But to have the, the students doing it parallel to the Statue of Liberty, basically it's out and then come on in and give it a hug while the violins are doing their thing. And then we can sit here and rest while they putz around with their shoulder rest and things. <laughs> <laughs> Those fussy other strings. <laughs> All right, so now you want to talk Next about silent, place and lift? Yeah, place and lift. Okay, so um, um, this is kind of related to what we were doing uh, before, but the, the place and lift, I think I actually demonstrated this. Uh, you set the bow here and you place it here, and I liked how Roland would say experiment with stretching out and back, even in the middle, make an X this way, make an X that way. When you exaggerate the angle, then they'll find the place that's, that's proper in the middle. Same thing with the fog, the X. Try it on the different strings, because the relationship is different of the arm and the fingers, but they're getting the feeling of this, again, in the silence, silence, feeling what's going on, examining. You know, some of our string kids are really smart, and they like to do the scientific kind of thing. So. I was talking about it as experimenting. My question for you is how do they know if it's straight? They're just like really good at that. But when you say exaggerate, <laughs> well, what I've found, if you say exaggerate the X this way, exaggerate the X this way, and they make it straight, they usually go like great. It, it's the same thing if I'm at, working on intonation, I say make it really short, make it really flat, and I'm going too, and they all land on the right pitch. It's like so cool. Mm -hmm. So way exaggerated this way, that way go straight, they usually I know, I, I did. I always had trouble with that. And so I would say li line up your eyes, uh, you know, so they're crossed eyes already, and see where the hairs are, and now look at the bridge and see if the bridge and the hairs are parallel. Okay, sort of works. Uh, I, I'm teaching a college level string techniques course, and some of them are, I just can't see it, I just can't see it. And I can see their eyes, I mean, literally, they are closer <laughs> together. And so I'll say, well, look. <laughs> they're trying. <laughs> Look at the end of the fingerboard. Your eye focus is, is a little farther away there. Now can you see the stick? Oh, that sort of made a difference. So um, I had actually a really young student one time, individual studio student, um, whose parents always came to the lesson. It was just wonderful. He was about five years old. 
And he was just a really active kid. And so one time he was doing this. I was trying to show him how to find a straight bow in the middle of the bow, just placing it there. And um, his eyes were not focusing, and, but it was more than that. I hadn't seen this before. They were actually jittering a little bit. And I asked the parents, have you had him, you know, has he ever had an eye exam? No. Well, sure enough, about a month later, they had been to the doctor and they discovered all sorts of things with his eyes. So sometimes you are the person who will be able to spot things in children that other people haven't noticed, even the parents. And they were both, edu mom and dad were both educators. So they just hadn't ever been that close up in a focused way like we are when we teach strings. So, um, so I don't have a, otherwise, I, I'm gonna try that next. Okay, well, what you I, just said, like, yeah, exaggerate yes. this way, exaggerate this way, and then right. find them. Well, and the other thing you, you told me is to go onto the bridge, and then they can feel where the arm level is for the, the extreme. Okay, uh, so we're down to, like, six. These are now three people said they do this one. Um, am I up first on this one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, polishing the string. Okay, so do you, do you know what this is? Like, I mean, you know this is clean, I don't mean that. Do you know what polishing the string is? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> 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 so, oh, dear. Oh, my gosh, long conference, but such a good one. Um, all right, so this is uh, for polishing the string. How many of you have used tissue to polish strings? Okay, so what we're doing is, is you know, maybe starting in rest position and just getting the hand to be loose. Now, this is for for shifting, but it's also for vibrato. And so um, using the Kleenex first in rest position, and what Roland would always do is successive approximation. I don't think he used that phrase, but, but first start here, uh, now let the thumb stick. My fingers are tunneling. They're not on top of the string. Students are always bugged by that. Like, where are my fingers supposed to be? You know, the good students are like, should they be on top of the strings? Don't worry. And in fact, don't even worry which ones are touching. I like to do it this way when we're not using the, the string so that the, or the tissue, so that the fingers are um, centered in the hand. The hand is more balanced this way and relaxed. So polish here, gradually move up here and here. Keep moving, keep moving, and then go over here. And now pretty much all of a sudden you have a, a vibrato motion. This thing on cellos. Okay, it was really hard for me to learn vibrato on cello and bass, but now that I know how to do it, I'm just jealous of the lower strings people because <laughs> this is just not natural to the body, and this is natural to the body. So, so what I would do then is also, besides the polishing of the strings, is take uh, take a pole. Can you all do this? Uh, this is how I would ask the class. What does this motion remind you of in all of life? Totally. You know, some Italian speaking, okay? And it may not be a nice thing either. I, I understand the back of the hand is not nice to that culture, okay? Uh, what else does that? Sorry? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you may not have Italian kids, so what else could that be? What else could that be? Fanning yourself. Oh, I'm so hot. I've never heard anybody say that fanning one. One of the books. Really? Oh, good. Wave at yourself, waving, hi, hi. I like to do when I'm placing the first finger, put a little smiley face, mm -hmm. so your fingernail friend is looking at you and smiling, you know? So fingernail friend, waving at yourself. Anything else come to mind? What about this? Roland was big on two hands first. He would go to the board and he would say, erase a small word off the board. Um, Lynn and Abby did this. Now just turn it around a little. And there's your vibrato. Well, not quite yet. You know, some people have circular vibrato because uh, for the upper string people, because it has to come this way eventually. It's got to go the direction of the string. So this isn't quite yet there. But does this movement remind you of anything? This movement. Does this remind oh, you? Salt and pepper. Salt and pepper. Yeah. Uh, you know what college students say? Do you have an idea? Any of you three? Margarita. Like shaking a pop can and opening it in some. <laughs> That's it. Okay. So see how many ideas there are. You don't have to be the cre only creative one in the room. All your kids are gonna be like, oh my gosh, don't say that. But yeah, let's ignore that one. But we'll go with this one. It doesn't really matter as long as they understand that these are natural movements of the body. We use this movement. Now, why does he do two hands? Because 
Most people in the world are right-handed. How many lefties do we have in here? <laughs> See what I mean? Okay, so that's great that you're left-handed because your skill for the left side will be great. You'll have trouble with your bow hand, but it doesn't matter because we have two different things going on. So let's do this, and now let's drop the right hand. Oh my gosh, it's powerful because your right hand is actually training your left hand how to do movement. Okay? And then we can do it this way. Roland said pat a dog. That was his thing. He, he said pat, like you're patting a dog, but it's, it's still just the repetitive motion of, of a natural movement that we would do with the body. Can I ask okay. a question? Yes. Your transition for understanding how to the body with each other, what, what was it that made the breakthrough for you? Because I have um, difficulty with the. Cello. With cello vibrato, yeah. because your brain is already programmed to do other strings, am I right about that? Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because that's a interference, I think, is the psychological term. This and this are two are so similar that your brain, since you've practiced this 10,000 times more than this, is interfering with this. That's, that's what I understand. I can't do that way. Yeah. So the thing that helps with the cello is if you come, oops, this way. Um, I call it the karate chop. So just karate chop on the upper bounce and then let your um, thumb stay behind so you're getting the right angle and direction and then put a, a finger, add your fingers to it. It, it gets a, the stronger feeling that you need for the cello. If you just are back here doing the polishing, it's really easy for them to pump and for them to twist and flop. But if they go towards the bout, I find that the cellist can get a better feeling for it. So for upper string, if you go, plus your arm will be in a straighter position, violinists tend to be tilted and your karate chop won't happen because you're in the wrong angle. Okay, and so that's the next slide is still about polishing the string, but the, the cello specific things that Joanne wrote here, polish with the full arm swing from the thumb, contact first uh, in the thumb and then in the crook of the neck, in first position first, right? Yep, so, okay. Um, pull, pulling and pushing a bow against resistance. All right, so if you would take your pen or pencil that you have handy and put your fingers together, index fin finger touching, um, be kind of in a bow shape, uh, pull with resistance against the pencil and then push with your index fingers coming together. So pulling and pushing, this is the feeling you'll have on the, on the bow when you're actually bowing. When you put it onto the bow, and your bow is sitting on the string, you should have feeling that the, the string actually in the bow is create, helping to create that resistance and you feel that same pulling action. And then the pushing action with your leaning towards that index finger towards the middle to go back. And this really helps with the pronation. That's, pronation was a word I got from Roland, used it a lot, it's not new to him, but. Um, that's the leaning on that index finger for that pushing back. So you pull. And I must say, I sure wish we used pull and push instead of up and down for our bow directions. Cello players do not like this. I'm just here to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Any bass players in the room? Pull and push is so much better. Yeah. Same for right. Same thing. Pull and push is what we do. Right. And, and the other, uh, another addition is to pinch the bow stick and pull and push. Because you really, if you create your own resistance, now what I'm feeling is a lot of tension in my shoulders right now, so you have to be sure that you get your body centered and breathe, and you know, kids hold their breaths a lot, you know. You don't even notice it until they start to, you know, get, they, they'll yawn actually. When they, when they yawn, that usually means their oxygen is not good in their brain, so be careful about that. Uh, so that's, that's a wonderful way to teach this flexibility, fluffy fro, all of it's related, and, and just a quick aside is if in order to do the flexibility this way, don't do it this way in front of you. Kids will go up and down with their arm instead. I uh, often had that happen. So, so Roland has a photo in the book. Drop the wrist. Now you can't go anywhere else with your arm, so it has to be done with the fine motors, the smaller muscles. And so go, you tell them the, the tip came waver. It has to go straight up, shoot like an arrow straight up to the ceiling. So that's a way. And Kirk Moss, I think, was writing people's names in the air. Rest it on your knee and write your, your own name. And so that encourages more flexibility. Okay. Case walk is uh, not for, uh, actually did have uh, cellists lift their cellos up over their <laughs> head. And, I had I a bass player who was feeling left out and Somebody he said, could I do it? <laughs> no, I don't 
that bass player, I stood right next to him and said, well, you can try, honey. You know, he, was a, he was a fifth grader, I think. And he went, oh, I got it. And he's shaking all over. So I just said, well, bring it down here and hold it. And so then he could do that too. But the case walk is the, another strength to relaxation. You know? And so what we do, yeah, that's my mouth open there. Uh. <laughs> um, what Roland would have the violin of the old players do is, is um, try, if, if you have young children, like my straps are in them, um, just have them do it this way. And what we're trying to do is get them to understand quickly from something that's kind of heavy, not with the instrument inside, just in <laughs> case it drops, um, and for the stronger ones to do it this way, put on some music and let's march around the room, that sort of thing. And then very quickly put the case down and pick up the instrument. This is after they already can place it in a good playing position and feel how light it is. So he writes about that. It's, it's something that we, we train our bodies like marathon runners do. You know, you go beyond what you have to do in order to be able to feel some level of comfort in the actual movement. So that's what the case walk is all about. And cellists? Yeah, the only thing um, with this with cello, I find, is they're, they're, again, left hand strength. So while they're marching around the room, the cello could do the song that you dance to. Or um, I like to have them strengthen their left hand by um, putting it on their, their knee and just squeezing and, and doing pulsing to strengthen left hand fingers and hand. So case walk is for strengthening and relaxing. So I do it with this action with my cello. Rather, it doesn't hurt for us to be stronger upward. But we play so much from shoulders down that that is not so needed for us. Okay, so next is early bow hold. Okay, yeah, early, okay. early bow hold this is um, at the balance point placement. So when you talked about having difficulty finding the, the balance point, my students love to do that to find the balance point. So if you put your hand here at first, and, and again, uh, Joanna mentioned earlier, don't stay here for a long time, but it's so much easier to hold it here. So if you're having a student who's doing really goofy things, down here. You can either do this first thing or do it for remediation for folks who are having trouble and then they just play from here to there. But the early bow hold is just a very helpful technique um, to use for holds. Mm -hmm. And so the same here, which I showed you earlier, once the instrument is in playing position, what I would do is, is start with this hold and then do the Statue of Liberty, get up here. Now, oh, oh, I'm doing something that I don't want to be doing. I'll show you that in a second. Uh, then transition the instrument to hold for two seconds without and then help here. And Roland wasn't big on, on this like military soldier look, you know, but that is the principle involved of holding the instrument is cantilever. You've got to have something for this energy to come back toward you over some, some shape here. So many uh, chin rests are so flat that there's hardly anything to hold on to and so the cantilever is coming onto this teeny little ridge. Um, he liked these bigger humps and so, you know, and then with a little help underneath, um, he was fine with the, the coons, although, um, I don't really know, no, sponges, I don't think we had coons even. He made those sponges. The sponges. Mm -hmm. um, and they were firm sponges, they weren't squishy sponges because they needed some resistance like these. <coughs> But anyway, so being able to have the positioning here and then hang over here and then do the bunny, not the fox. He used that also. Peer through it. We're touching here. He sh he's all, it's all in the book that, that he gives this bow hand feel. And then move it. And I would sing little bunny foo foo or we would do, you know, different little songs so that this is all really relaxed before it opens and bites, you know, but I, I hated that term bite too because he was like, don't call it a bow grip. That's such a bad term. Let's call it a bow hold and let's hold gently here. Baby bird hold even, you know, that was something that, uh, you know, picking up a baby bird, you don't want to drop it, but you also want to hold it very gently. That's a good image for you. And then slide down to the balance point and do your rock and your roll. And then after you play a few, you know, short strokes, transferring over. He wasn't big on E string first, although I like that down up thing idea. Uh, he often did a lot of D strings first. And then after that, you know, a few, few weeks, my, maybe not even that, maybe just a few lessons, then do the slide all the way down to the frog, same thing, shake, roll, transfer, place and lift, adding some resistance. 
lot of good exercises for Can the bird. Yes. Is there some advancement in their playing that makes you say, now I'm going to go to the regular bow hold spot as opposed to the balance To me, it's more strength in the hand. The child's hand is weak. It's, it ha they, we just don't use this side of our hand for hard to I understand, but what makes you know the kid is ready to move to the... When I see that they are strong enough, a lot, a lot of times it's the tapping. If they're tapping and they're having trouble even just lifting their finger, that's not a good indication to me that they're ready yet. Um, now, I might not think that they're actually ready, but I want to get them out of the habit of this, so I might go ahead and just try it to see what happens. If I get a lot of this, then I might do this because then the balance feels like there's no, nothing to, to hold. The balance is all right here, and I can help them. Pinky House was my favorite thing because it's I just made it with tape and it was sticky on the inside and just set their pinky right inside the pinky house. We have all kinds of pink, you know, helps and aids like that. Um, thumb things, tapping, Mr. Bent Thumb. I think the very important place was a Suzuki thing I heard. Touch the very important place on your chin. Now touch it on your head. You know, so now they're thinking about what that bent thumb feels like. Hide it and now show it to somebody. <laughs> so, things like that so that they're constantly thinking about what that shape is. Sorry? Could you just say that one more time? That sequence you just did. The Mr. Bent Thumb? Yeah. Yes, and uh, we could call it a mountain peak or we could call it, uh, Kay Sloan was, was a Suzuki teacher that I took the pre-twinkle, I don't even think they do pre-twinkle anymore, but um, the very important place. If you say it that way, it sticks in their memory better. And then you can touch your very important place on your chin, you can touch it on your head. You can do it with the bow in hand too. You know, so it doesn't have to just be with the hand. Now, touch your very important place on your forehead. Touch it on your ear. You know, things, just for kids, just for fun. Hide it and show it to somebody. You know, they smile a lot. And, and I would say in answer to your question, for, for me, it's, it's related to that as a sort of a graduation thing. When you're ready to come down here and keep your thumb in that right place, because this is what they all want to do once they get this handle down here to grab a hold of. So um, the graduation is you can go down and you can keep that very important going on while you're at the prom. So can they graduate to it? And if they're not successful, they're back here until they're ready. So some are ready at different times. But it's I'm not very long. Like I have seen some people play here like for a year or two. It's like yeah. too long. Um, I'm not, I used to teach that the, the cello thumb should be the same as the violin viola thumb, but oh my gosh, no, 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 um, because it's too much tension. So just make sure that your very important place looks a little different for lower strings than for It's a C for cello. It's a C for cello. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you something really before quickly. about dance cellos? Is that someone that has a lot of tension with their right hand? Would you suggest going back to the middle? Um, those, uh, very fast, I might even have them go underneath temple every now and then just to open that thumb up because you can play quite a bit this with the thumb underneath. Um, you also might try putting a corn pad or something there to cushion where the thumb is so the thumb feels more relaxed if they're already you know, playing a lot. Or you can use it even for younger students. But, but they, the other thing is intermittently stop, tap the thumb, take it off, check it. Yeah, they really need to release the thumb. I'm just wondering if Roland was specific about where the thumb touches the finger at the crease or the middle pad. At the crease. At the crease. In between the two. For does it matter between cello and upper string? Uh, don't know that. No, it was you the same thing. Right the, behind that first and crease. Did it like the just, first phalanx. The one behind there. the crease. Yeah. For yeah, behind the crease. So, I feel my nail a little. My nail's a little too long, but. At the crease. The picture's now, pretty good in the Okay, the that brings me to every hand is different. And some hands are going to be more this way already naturally. We had a student who, my goodness, her first finger was so long, longer than her second finger. You know, well, that's totally, you're going to do things a little differently because of the shape. Same way with all this setup here. So, thank you. Um, do we, let's see, four minutes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, we do have. A oh, really fun thing to do this very quickly. Can I have a volunteer to shake hands with me while I play? How about over here in the middle? Okay, come on up.
Um, do you want to do something with the left arm swinging too? Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. The cello left arm, we'll just swing that. We won't do the sh shake hands. This is kind of, I, I, they did this in Suzuki land too. Will you just shake hands to, with me on all the open strings of the ukulele? Okay, so pretend like you're playing. Yeah, just stand directly in front of me. Okay, and we're going to play, play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Shake our left hands. Now, if the setup's not good, you know what'll happen. Is they'll feel like you're dropping. So you want to be able to have that cantilever thing working really well for them. So here give, we go. Give play D. twinkle. Pardon? Give, give D. D. Okay. Ready? Go. <laughs> Understand the same same principles. It's beautiful. He was technologically astute. Um, okay. Yeah. This is so that the students can position quickly without fiddling. That's right. You've seen students do that. Like I don't think I have that in the right place. So you want to make sure that they're able to quickly place. And go. Otherwise, uh, you know, the, there's a, a film where the student, a good friend of mine, actually has a child that's going like this in many places. And you've probably all seen it. Questions? So, how advanced are they when you're doing this? How advanced yeah, are, how are they? they play when you do the these, pick up the These down? little kids on the films had only played two years, I think, and they were approx they weren't really young. They they probably started at about what would you say the youngest? Six or seven? Maybe, yeah. Third, fifth grade. And so, you know, they're I'm just saying it's at least a year. At old. least yeah, don't do this with your kids. So there there is yeah. all over the place. <laughs> Sorry, where are the films? Are they available for purchase? The films are, they are available for purchase. Um, it's a DVD, and I know that Peter Rowland, the son of Paul, um, is in Arizona, and he has a website. Can you fast forward to the last slide or two? Okay, we're having the workshop this summer. If you want to go to the University of Illinois website, and there are some flyers at the back. Steve Burian is here from U of I, if you have any questions about the workshop. And then, um, go, go one more slide. I think our contacts, if you contact me, I'll put you in touch with, uh, with Peter, who can get you the information about the You might be able to find them on Amazon, but I haven't personally seen them there. I've seen the book, but not the DVD. Uh, they're fabulous. They're old. Like, the, the people who are young kids are my age in the films. Uh, Danny Foster was in our stream with him. He's the, the star, pretty much. Boy, of the whole yeah. series. Uh, so, if you want to contact us about any questions about Roland um, materials, Joanne has done some fabulous things with lower strings, but all all through her teaching, and I've done public school K through kindergarten Suzuki Roland program. I called it when I was um, in a in a magnet school, and I had 450 <laughs> students finally before I left that one school. It was amazing. So, um, we've got lots of ideas that we were able 